Welcome back to the Swider Show. Obviously, this this show comes with a little bit of a, a sadder tone today. The Lakers season is over. Um, we 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 end up losing in the Western Conference Finals to Denver Nuggets, a, a very well very well coached team, a, a great team, honestly. And uh, yeah, although it comes with a little sadder tone, it, it was obviously a great rookie season, and um, got to learn a lot during these playoffs. So, Patty, yeah, I know Congrats, it's sad, brother. But, Hey, thanks, man. First, it's the worst. Be first of many. Yeah, it's it's the worst when uh you know a season end. There's really no way to prepare for it. The day to day just like stop so abruptly. There's really no other job like that in the entire world. But yeah, um, yeah. It's uh, my first question is like, are you able to reflect right now? I feel like the answer is probably no. But like the fact that you guys ended up losing in the Western Conference, even though it was a sweep. Side note, probably the most competitive sweep I've maybe ever seen. I felt like every <laughs> single game could have gone either way. But are you able to, like, juxtapose where you were in November to, to like, actually making the Western Conference Finals, even though you lost and you're, you're pissed off? It's like, wow, that, that was probably, a, you know, like, if you were to trade this, somewhere to offer you this in November, you'd probably take the deal, I'm assuming. 100%. I mean, you can't. Kind of- the way we look at our season is, is it was like segmented, right? You have that two and ten start, then we're, we battled back. I think we were like thirty and thirty two, so like we played pretty good basketball after that two and ten start. And then once you make those trades and, and kind of like you reconfigure your roster, mm-hmm. you, you you make you make deals to to get your team to a point where you can at least make the playoffs, be competitive in the playoffs. You have a competitive roster, and uh, honestly. I saw I saw a really good point. It's like this this series that we lost against Denver wasn't we didn't lose it in that actual series. We lost it because we were playing playoff basketball for three months, and LeBron and mm-hmm. we were playing at such a high level for that long long period of time. It's hard to maintain that for this series. So, like you said, like every single game was coming down to like the last couple possessions of the game. Tough tough to lose in the fashion that we lost in um, with LeBron having the ball in his hands at the end of the game and. Um, honestly, Do you think that was a foul at the end? When I when I watched it from the ref's angle, it didn't look like a foul. But I mean, obviously, biasedly, <laughs> yeah, uh, I think it, it, they probably could have called it. But I was I was fine with the no call, especially at the end of the yeah. game. Yeah. So yeah, man, it, just just a great season overall. I learned learned so much about myself, about the NBA game. Um, honestly, just learned a lot, a lot about. The whole entire NBA in general, what it takes to make a deep run in the playoffs, what it takes to put together a, a really good roster, um, how guys play with each other, how guys can mm-hmm. can get better. Um, and honestly, it was just a great, great learning experience and a great experience for my first right. season. Yeah, I want to uh, touch on like your individual season later on, maybe, maybe rank some of the best moments. But as far as the Nuggets go, I think as a casual on Twitter, um, you know, as a casual fan, they're way better than I thought they were. Yeah, I'll say that right now. Like those last two games, I thought for sure going into them, I thought you guys were going to win both of them. But the fashion in which they won both of them was very, very impressive. Um, so I don't know. I, I feel like whoever comes out of the East will probably talk about that series a little later. But the Nuggets look like they're just kind of humming right now. They're going to be pretty hard to beat. There's a uh, there's certain teams that you play against that just fit really well together. Like the pieces fit. They've played together for a, a long, a long period of time. And you see that in college basketball a lot, like, like a team like Colgate or a team like throughout the country. Yeah. Like you, you especially at the Dome. Well, yeah. Oh well, yeah. Especially at the Dome. But, but like Kansas every year, I feel like they have guys who play together for like two, three years and, and, and they're experienced and they know, and they know how to play with each other. That's what, that's what Denver kind of poses for us. Right. Denver has guys who play together where the pieces fit and you really have the same team besides KCP, but KCP fits anywhere that he plays. Yeah. He's a three. Like they have shooting, they have athleticism, they have rim protection. They have a, a two superstars who, who excel at different parts of the game. You mm-hmm. have Jokic who dominates the first three quarters. Then Jamal Murray just takes over the fourth quarter. Yeah. The way Jamal Murray was playing, it was like, it was almost like playing Steph again. Yeah. His confidence, his ability to get downhill, his post ups. Um, he definitely shook the uh, the like bubble Murray thing. I feel like people use that almost as like a slight to him. Like the only time he's played well in the playoffs is the bubble. People say it doesn't count. We don't acknowledge that take, but he was as good as any guard can be in that series, like from beginning to end. 
And at the end of the day, it's it's a make or miss league, and they made their shots, and we missed we missed our shots in, in, in key moments. Like when you look at when you look at like the actual percentages and stuff like that, they're not that much different. Or like the protection that we got off the bench, like Bruce Brown played really well, but Rui played really well. Um, yeah, and and there was certain moments where each guy stepped up, but it just felt like all their shots that they hit were timely shots. Yeah, like Porter Porter hit would miss a couple in the first half and hit a timely one in the second half. Mm-hmm. ACP would, would miss a couple early that hit a timely one in the second half. Like they just had so many guys step up in big moments, it was really hard to overcome. And I think uh, it just wore on us throughout the series, and we were just dependent on our big dogs a lot. Yeah, that's what uh, the second half of, of game four. I mean, LeBron was unbelievable in that game, but you just can't expect him to go. I think he sat for four seconds, but um, yeah, I was just very impressed, especially with their role guys like KCP, Bruce Brown, Aaron Gordon. Those those guys are like kind of who ended up winning that last game, even though Mourinho you know, could you're unreal. But and it's and it's funny because the last couple of years, when I see Bruce Brown, when I see Terrence Mann, when I see some of these guys who I, who I grew up playing with, I root for them in the playoffs, right? It's just natural for me to root for those guys. Now Bruce is over here just torching our team, talking <laughs> crap. One of one of our assistant coaches coached him in Brooklyn, so he's talking crap to him. Like it was just overall just a, a crazy series. Talking crap, nothing like talking crap. Yeah, <laughs> just talking, just talking crap, man. <laughs> and uh, yeah, no, overall great series, but it was uh, it was definitely it was definitely a, a great learning lesson for me. Just just. Just being at that level in the playoffs and, and being right. on that run. Do you think Jokic now like takes over as best player in the league? I'm always fascinated by how that like hierarchy works. Right. I feel like every single year whoever wins the championship is the best player in the league. Yeah. Right? I think <laughs> like, I think that should probably be how it goes. But then coming in this year, like no one was saying that about Steph, I feel like. I don't know. Uh I kind of disagree with that. I think people crowned Steph again after, after last season. You think so? I feel like Giannis was still hands at like him or Jokic or Embiid. Yeah. yeah I guess it depends difference. on who you talk but, to, but yeah, there's also a difference of like the best player doesn't always win the championship, right? Like because and it's, it's really hard to to gauge that, right? Because there's so many different skills in the basketball game. If you look at most complete player, it would be hard to put. Jokic as the best player in the league because defensively he's probably not even in the top half. Right. So so like when you look at best player, I guess you you put Giannis up there, you put Embiid up there, they're two way players. I would put AD up there, two way player. Mm-hmm. Um but yeah, man, Jokic is he's special. The threes the threes he was in that the he had like five threes that were just complete desperation shooting up like like Larry Bird. He, he looked like someone at the Y that throws it up, and as soon as their feet touch the ground, they go and get the rebound, like the old follow your shot type of thing. Yeah. And every single one, we just go in. <laughs> wow. But, yeah, that's what you were saying before. Like the timeliness of those shots was crazy. But It was unbelievable. Like, there were certain points in the game where LeBron was just looking at the guy giving him a thumbs up, giving him a salute, t- tip of the cap type of thing. That's all you can do. Like you said before, it's a make or miss league. It is. Probably but, the first time you ever heard that, too. Yeah, that's I mean, that's an original Swider show saying along with a lot of them. So, um, guards guards win in March. Is, is right. Yeah, awesome you love show. that one. Yeah, <laughs> you love that one. But um, like I said before, individually, have you had time to reflect? Do you, do you have some top moments throughout your rookie season that you could give us the listeners? I'm not a listener. I'm a host. But yeah. Um. Trying to think. I, I think just the whole entire year. I, I haven't had a lot of time to reflect yet. I'm kind of right. still like coming coming down off that wave. But my, my my initial thoughts of the season is obviously LeBron breaking the scoring record. That's got to be one. I think the trade deadline for me has to be two. Just you, you have a whole entire different new group of guys, right? Mm-hmm. You go from having one set group of guys that you're used to and you're close to, and like even a guy like Thomas Bryant who's on Denver Nuggets. He's coming up to me, asking me how I'm doing, how's my family. Like stuff like that. So you have the mm-hmm. close knit relationship with those guys. You get a whole new team. Those guys end up being great. Um, and I think just three is just going through the playoffs with these guys, right? Like right. going going to Memphis, battling that series, winning that series in six. Go seeing like a LeBron Steph matchup in round two, like having that like emotional like roller coaster of 
you, you feel great after game one. After game two, they think they figured you out because they put Jermichael Green in the starting lineup. Mm-hmm. Game three, um, you blow him, you blow him out. Game four, LeBron, we we went a, we went a tight one, right? Mm-hmm. Um, in, in game four, both series, like we're literally making. Yeah, seriously, you go shots. either way. Yeah, the Lion so, Walker yeah, game. Exactly, the Lion Walker game. Um, game five, you go to Golden State. It's like you can see like the attention to detail wasn't really there from us in, in both game fives when we go at Memphis, at Golden State to close out the series. We come back home, we finish around at home, right? It's just like it was uh, it was amazing to go through that with those guys and just where we, where we had been earlier in the year to get to the Western Conference Finals. It was it was special. Mm-hmm. And I think if this group were to run it back together, I know that's a constant theme that we've been hearing with all these players' interviews and Rob and Darvin and all these guys when they when they talk about these postseason press conferences, like give us a training camp, give us a give us a preseason, yeah. give us give us a regular season perhaps, together. And, perhaps some retirement. Yeah, we can talk so about break that. News. Tristan Thompson or <laughs> yeah. but no, just sticking on that point real quick. I was I was reflecting on your rookie year, and I feel like you packed almost a full career's worth of experiences with him. Like you were on a team that was considered bad, disappointing. Everyone's like, "Oh, this team is going nowhere for the first what month and a half, six weeks." Yeah. Then you got to start playing better. First of all, LeBron is on your team, AD is on your team, so that whole experience starts last summer. But then yeah. you guys kind of turn it around. Um, obviously you have all like the big regular season games around national TV all the time. You're playing on Christmas day. LeBron breaks the scoring record, maybe the biggest moment in the history of the regular season. Yeah. Like you said, the next day you get to experience a giant trade deadline, like a classic LeBron team trade deadline where everything's overhauled. It's like, all right, well now we're, now it's championship or bust. You're then making a playoff push. You get in the playoffs. And then, uh, yeah, like you said, I mean, you played three of the bigger series that you can <laughs> within like a, a career in yeah. literally two months. So I don't know. It was, it was fun to watch. It was good stuff. It's crazy, man. It's obviously like, I, I can't wait to be in position. Hopefully these next couple of years, where I get to play in those series and I get to experience it. And I get to mm-hmm. go through the, the good wins, the bad law. Like, obviously I was there to, to witness all those things. It was different just to be in the battle. Right. And I'm, right. I'm excited for those opportunities in the future. Do you think? Do you watch the game through that lens? Like how I can fit into this game? Hundred like, percent. I, I felt yeah. like in this last series, I could have helped a lot. With my three point mm-hmm. shooting with my, with my ability to stretch the court. Just watching these guys like Tavis Caldwell Pope and Michael Porter and and Jamal Murray. Like just the, to me, I, I obviously think defense is really important. You need to be a really good defensive team to make it this far. But at the, at the end of the day, it comes down to shot making. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like, there's gonna. There's going to be points in the series where, like, you're going to be good enough defensively to kind of keep these guys tamed down. But at the end of the day, you're going to know every all the team's plays. You're going to know the, the tendencies of every single player, who can make tough shots, and who can make plays when it matters in the playoffs. And uh, Denver was able to make a, make more plays than us in, in all four games. So it was it's it's, it's tough to swallow, um, but at the same time, it's, it's just one of those things where you tip your cap, mm-hmm. move on, and and uh, hopefully we're able to run it back with a similar team and, and I can I can take an advanced role and, and kind of go from there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that is fascinating. I was always thinking that when I saw you on the bench because I feel like it's hard not to think that. I thought that last year as a walk-on. It's like, I wonder how it would go if I was on the court right now. Probably different in my mind than uh, how you're thinking. But um, like we said before, do you want to talk about the Brown thing? Like how yeah. how, how did you find out about that? Was that just through Twitter? I mean, I saw, I saw, yeah, I saw yeah. on Twitter. I, I got an ESPN notification. Um, my initial thoughts of hearing that is no way he just dropped forty in a in a game four of elimination the game final. Yeah, like. Um, but at the same time, he's he's in the he's in the locker room at halftime doing Norma Tech boots, laying down, like trying to do everything he possibly can to squeeze out. 24 minutes in the second half to, to push us to victory, right? Like, right. You, you think about LeBron's career and how many finals he's been to, how many – he's played 20 years, he's been to 10 finals. He's, like, constantly just pushed himself to the limit every single year physically to, to be able to make it. And then this year, he had to play playoff basketball since, like, December. We, mm-hmm. we talk about him having 47 points on his birthday against Atlanta Hawks to – 
to push us over. And, and the comments after the game are, hey, LeBron, like, um, what was your mindset going into, in today's game? He goes, I was scoring 30 and we weren't winning. So I, I might, <laughs> yeah. I, I, I told myself I might as well just try 40. Like, mm-hmm. he's just been playing at such a high level the whole entire season and he's put his body through so much, right? Like, this might be a hot take. It might be, I'm not, there's, I'm not trying to sound um, disrespectful to any players or because we did right. have injuries in that first first part of the season. But he, if we have the roster we have at the end of the year, I don't think he has the injuries that he has because he, he's not forcing himself through trying to play these games. Yeah, it's just not as it's not as grueling to, to keep us in the hunt. Yeah. I think an ideal LeBron season at this point in, in his career is playing sixty games in an eighty-two game schedule. And obviously not getting hurt, but having those 22 games off throughout a season, if that's one game a week, if that's one game every two weeks to, for him for him to take off, to be able to have that stretch run in the playoffs where he's mm-hmm. at full strength. Um, so I think just him pushing himself to the absolute limit, like just made it so he he got hurt, he, he rushed back. And I think this offseason is going to be a big offseason for him to, to really sit down and think about, hey, like, I know how old I am. I know how, how much I've accomplished. Right. I know. I know. I can still just give this game a lot more. But it is my body, is my mind, is everything ready to go? Yeah. Because, like, like he said at the beginning of the season in, in the preseason press conferences, like on media day, he was like, "I know my body's going to be good, but it's all about my mental. Like, can my mental yeah. still still do the work every single day and not be tired of it?" So, right. I mean, he, he'll make the right decision and. I'd be very surprised if he didn't come back. Yeah, I think everyone would be, especially after watching him completely dominate that game. Like he was the best player in the game, and a guy well, he, like that we're talking about being the best player in the world was on the other team. LeBron well, was still that was like a like, vintage. Yeah, Are you gonna say this career high it. and a half. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's nuts. I was actually so surprised by that. I feel like he would have scored more than thirty-one in like one of those twenty eighteen runs, but yeah. What what is but let's just stay on this topic, Patty. Mm-hmm. What do you think is the best playoff run by LeBron James in in, in his twenty years? So obviously, ten finals appearances. Um, and uh, we, had this, we we had this discussion. Uh, I was I was in locker room. It was me, Randy Ramos, who is LeBron's manager. Um, it Keith Keith is uh, AD's manager. Mm-hmm. Pip and and Damian Jones, who's played on LeBron's Cavs teams and also coached him. We had this, right. we had this uh, conversation. What was what would be your opinion on that best best overall runs? Um, I feel like individually, it's probably eighteen. I yeah. think when when he was actually the best player was probably twenty thirteen, right? Because those were probably beating the best teams. Because twenty eighteen, like you go to seven against Indiana, the team was not great, but like LeBron was so head and shoulders, the best player in the world for well, that also- entire run. We also think about the roster that he had with him as well. That's what I mean. Indiana was a formidable opponent. They, they were – Victor Lugino yeah. was, was – was, But was, then who do they I'm play second? Oh, LeBronto. Yeah, LeBronto. A 60-win six, Toronto team. Right, and then seven against the Celtics, but that was like rookie Tatum and Brown, and then they lose to – But that was when – Like, I, I, my answer would be I think that was when he was the best, like his individual best playoffs – but I don't think it could be his best run if you don't win the title. So I would say 2013. I disagree with you because I, I think that I don't look at the result of winning a championship to be your best. Like Oh, failure's win. not. No, the not, honest not take. even that. Not, not, not even the honest take. Just just in terms of like when you're playing at your highest level, that doesn't mean like to me, I, I see his team in 2013. He has two other Hall of Famers on that team. Yeah. And and they also play against a really 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 good Spurs team, right? Yeah, and they beat so them, right? And and they end up beating them. But that 2018 run, you look at like he has Kevin Love, ar- arguably a Hall of Famer, right? Yeah. But besides that, I'll I'll kind of compare that team to like what we had early in the season with a with a minus AD, right? Like yeah. He brought that that team decided to run it back the next year. They started out the season 0 and 11. Right. He brought that well, team that's to the what, finals. Actually, it's probably 
like dismissive of us to get this long in the conversation, not mention 2016. I'm just trying to think of who they beat in the East that year. I don't remember. Like, yeah. what was that? Like the 60 win Hawks? 2016. 2016? Yeah. Yeah. Beat the Hawks that year. Dennis Schroeder was on that team. Um, he, he, he beat Toronto. Yeah. Yeah, he definitely beat Toronto. He beat them every year. I'm changing my answer yeah. to 2016 because then, like, that's probably the greatest accomplishment anyone has is beating the – he, he beat the seven three one Warriors. He beat the Pistons, Hawks, and the Raptors in twenty sixteen. Okay, so I think the Hawks were like nasty that year. I'm changing my answer to that. It's twenty sixteen. Yeah, just in my mind, oh. I feel like like two way wise, LeBron was at, like at his best in twenty thirteen. He probably had his best individual run in twenty eighteen, but his best actual playoff run start to finish was twenty sixteen. So there you That's go. Funny. You got three answers for you. But yeah, I'd say his best run front to back is 2016. I'm changing my answer. Yep. Just because, I don't know, to end it with that, that's that's like the crowning achievement of his career. What was it, What were you, uh, like all those guys saying? So Randy would say 2013 or 2016. Mm-hmm. Keith was saying 2016. Um D. Jones had a, had a unique one because he was on the team in 2007. He thought the 2007 run was unbelievable. Right. Um, him, be, him being able to get to that point. Um, and I'm a big 2018 guy. Like, Yeah, you always have been. How, how dominant he was in that playoff run from every aspect of the game and the way he carried that team. And they even called Maverick Carter his, his business manager as well. And Maverick said that uh, – the 2018 was was the best run that he had. So, I don't know. I'm, I'm a big 2018 guy just because the, the, the roster that he had on that team and, and to be able to bring them to that moment mm-hmm. was special. Yeah, I just think from a mental aspect at that point, too, he had broken down a seven-game series to, like, a science that no one ever will do again. Yeah. Like, he knew exactly going into every single game, like, exactly what needed to be done. Like they go on two oh, I think two separate times in that run. It's like now we're still just probably gonna win the series. So <laughs> But I don't know. That, that's a good question. It also proves how good he is that there's like fifteen different answers. That was a good debate. My uh definitive answer, I'm blocking in twenty sixteen, you're twenty eighteen. Uh you guys could uh re- reply in the comments with, with what you think. We'll use that as our copycat league, what you think is, is LeBron's best run. But um so are any off season plans individually? What are you focusing on? Where are you going to be? Yeah. yeah, so, I mean, for every NBA player, like, the off-seasons are different, right? Like, for me, my off is going to be a lot shorter this year. Just, just have to play in summer league. So, I think I'm just going to go home two weeks and, and try, try to spend some time with my family, Get hopefully head up to Boston and hang out hang out with, like, my boys. Right. Um, work, work, work out a little bit in those two weeks and then come back here, start getting ready for summer league. After yeah. summer league, be able to go home again, maybe like a little vacation. Uh, oh yeah, come back, then come back here in August. Um, Where are you going, Newport? <laughs> shoot. Uh, <laughs> What's that? Like ten minutes from you? Yeah, not even. Yeah, I, I said Adam was special. Yeah the the Newport trip. Newport is sweet, actually. It's got nothing on Bethany Beach, of course, but yeah, it's a good old town. It's a cute old town. But uh, yeah, Newport, Newport's a great spot. What are you working on? Uh, we work out with Charlie again this summer in LA. Work out with Charlie when I'm in LA, and I'll work out with him. I got Pierre Sully when when I'm yeah. back uh, when I'm back home. So two, Charlie, two early trainers. early friend of the show. We got to have him back on. Yeah, nah, for sure. He uh, he has some great stories. He he's been he's been grinding though. He's been working out Stanley. He's been working out Ben Matherin. He's been working out like a lot of guys in, in Orange County. He's still doing his AAU stuff with his high school team. Mm-hmm. So. Charlie has a busy summer ahead of him. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm gonna be. I'm gonna. Be, I'm gonna make sure I work him. Yeah. Uh, make sure. Make sure he's driving all over the place and and, and accommodating me too. That's a. That's the thing with those summer. guys. Like the off season is just like when they're at their busiest, obviously, because that's when all you guys are working out. But um, definitely. What was I gonna ask? Oh, when is summer league? Specific summer dates, you know. July seventh through seventeenth, Las Vegas, Nevada, <laughs> UNLV. Yep. Um. Yeah, it should, it should be a great one. Obviously, I hope we get to play against uh. Victor Winyanaba. Hopefully he plays in the summer league yeah. and we're able to match up. That would be musty TV, Swider Times Wemby. Um, yeah. we might have some big things coming for the show. It's a little tease for summer league. We're trying to yeah. trying to get that figured out. But that's where the Blue Wire Studios are. So 
Um, we might be for coming to you for our first first live show. Not live, but like all of us in the same place recording from the same room. Big time. Yeah, no, that, that would be, be a great experience. That would sure. be big time. But uh, that's why our last thing, you mentioned going home to Boston. It's currently 3-1 in the, in the Celtics series. Do you think they could do this? Do you think they could come back? And I feel free to chime in with your takes too, as our uh, as our Celtics expert. I can go first. Yeah, go okay. All right. Yeah. yeah Wider can go think ahead. about his no before I actually say how he can. <laughs> um, here's what I'll say: If there was a team to do it, it would be a Boston team, and it would be a Boston team that is facing a team that is an eight seed with some undrafted guys. Nothing against undrafted guys, and they've done amazing. Seriously, so come on. No, nah, I'm just messing. Uh, in, in all cases, <laughs> though, the shooting luck eventually will run out, I think, at least for one game for the Heat. I think I don't think they can shoot 61% from three as a team mm-hmm. in the next three games. And uh, we've got two of the next three at home if we win, if we go to seven. Um, I, I think it's possible. I don't think it will happen, obviously. Like, statistically, it's never happened. But I think it's possible. I'm holding out hope. And the recipe is... Uh... The game recipe is 100% six. there. We'll be watching game six at a bar patty this weekend. In, in, uh, in a CMD? Beach. Yeah. I, yes, sir. I all my life have wanted to see a 3-0 comeback, and this is this would be the worst if this was the one that would happen. <laughs> I would I wouldn't hate shut to up. see this. I, I, I wouldn't shut up. I'll, I'll yeah. Even, so. So not I, even you. Why, you're, why you're, not? you're a good Celtics fan, but I don't know. Thank most you. of the fan base is just very insufferable. Why can't they do it? Cool. I think there is a chance that they can do it. I, I think just the overall, like the talent of the Celtics, like they do out- outmatch the Heat in, in terms of talent, right? They do have two superstars. They have shooting. They have a, a deeper bench. They have Al Horford, like to match up on Bam out of bio. Like they do have the pieces to win those games. I just think overall, the best player in the series, the best player in the playoffs so far has been Jimmy Butler. Jimmy Butler, if, if they do get to a game six, I just don't see him losing mm-hmm. in the that game i think the boston i honestly i think i would pick boston to win this next game at home to go three so and bring it back to miami i think there is a there is a slight momentum uh shift within the series so i i could see uh the Celtics winning this game but i think if it gets back to miami jimmy the way jimmy has played this this playoff run what he did to milwaukee like it's just sticking in my mind is like, all right, this guy is going to come through and, and, and do it again. Mm-hmm. So that, that's that's the only reason why I would say that it won't happen. Can, do the Celtics have the ability to do it? I think they have the roster. I think they have the, the players who have been there, who have been in these moments to to, to play well. But are they going to show up? Is, is Tatum going to make timely shots in the fourth quarter? Is Jalen Brown going to get out of the shooting slump? Is is Malcolm Brogdon going to have zero points in, again? <laughs> I don't think Malcolm Brogdon will have zero points against him. I think there is a chance. Right. I think they win game five and then get blown out in game six. Because the big that. thing is, like, you know, they lose game five. It's game six. The Heat have dropped two. Then everyone's going to be like, oh, now the pressure shifts to Miami. If you were to pick two people in these playoffs that can handle pressure, it's probably Spolster and Jimmy Butler. You yeah. know what I mean? Like, I feel I like agree. Spolster, those two guys are just not going to allow their team to lose four straight times. And they might even, like – get a rise out of being like, all right, now we're not the underdog. Like we're the ones that are supposed to kick ass and we're just probably going to do it. So I don't know. Um, the other thing on the Celtics real quick, both your takes on uh, the Grant, Grant Williams thing. Last, last week when he was talking shit to Jimmy, I kind of liked it, honestly. Yeah. I, I think for me as a competitor, like his comments after the game were not like Dylan Brooks-esque. You know what I mean? Like yeah. they weren't like, I'm like, I cope bears or anything like that. Like he respects Jimmy as a player. I think that's good, like good competition, respectful competition, two guys who respect each other. And at the end of the day, Jimmy Butler is a better player than Grant Williams. We should expect <laughs> Jimmy Butler to make those shots over Grant Williams. Do right. I think, do I think Grant Williams like woke him up and said, no, Jimmy Butler's been doing this all playoffs. That's he what I don't a, understand that. Take. And Grant like, Williams oh, played Grant well so too. Dumb. Yeah. Like he was playing and pretty Grant, good defense. And Grant played well. He played well in the offensive end. He made big shots. He made it. He made a nice, he made a nice dunk. He had a nice porch dunk. Like, I think porch that Grant dunk? Williams. Oh, well, yeah. I call it the dunker. Like, the little, 
But porch dunk? Is that a term that you just said? At, at Villanova, we call it the porch. Oh, I love that. The little dunker dunker areas. So I right. think that um I think that the team needed some firepower. If That's, you remember yeah. where they were at in the series, there's nothing wrong with doing that. Like it did not wake Jimmy Butler up. And they missed the Celtics missed every single shot after that. It wasn't because of those comments. They weren't hitting uh-huh. shots in the series anyway. So it didn't make Celtics worse. It just made it just it was a t- badly timed action that lined up with them blowing another game, which they did three yeah. times in a row. So yeah, I, th- I thought he was trying to like light a fire, as people say, and then his teammates not let him down. But I don't know. It seems like it seems like his teammates might get like sort of annoyed with him at times, and they're just like, "Dude, like, could you stop, please?" But as far as the principal goes, I actually agreed with him. Um, yeah, that was that was the last thing I wanted to bring up there. I don't think they won the series, but we will see next next <laughs> next time we uh, record. It might be it might be a historic Celtics Nuggets series or uh, Heat Nuggets. How do you guys feel about that last thing? I keep saying last thing, but people are complaining about Nuggets Heat. I don't know. I feel like it'll be a good series, but I might not watch a second of it i don't know jimmy butler wins that's an all-time run all time Mm -hmm. that that's what i'll be watching for if if Jokic wins he wins he wins his first title you know so there's stuff to Mm -hmm. watch for if you're a basketball fan if you're just watching for Embiid and tatum and whoever else and Giannis, whoever else has been kicked out of the playoffs already then you're not watching for basketball you're watching for your favorite team well, I think I think the big the biggest thing was that we we could have had the, the alternative Celtics, Lakers, yeah, the Celtics Lakers, and everyone would been tuned for that LeBron versus the Celtics and Tatum's up like is Tatum going to take the throne from him and all this different thing. I think that that would have been awesome to see. Obviously, it would have been selfishly that would have been great for me. Oh, it would have been I'm awesome going Boston, like be with the Lakers in that in that title run, right? But I think overall, if you if you look at this, if you look if Assuming the Heat do win this series, you have Jimmy Butler, probably the most unlikely person to ever be in the situation to the playoff run that he has had. Inspiring, motivating, an unbelievable guy who who just works and, and, and honestly is living like the American the so so the American, <laughs> the American dream. dream. Wow, the we're American going there. Dream. I love that. First, the per, first the person who's won the, the MVP the last two years, like that is right. That should be must see TV. But the Croatian dream. Yeah, the Croatian dream. Is the Serbian dream. Serbian, Serbian dream. dream. Luke is Croatian, right? Lu- Luke is uh, Slovenian. All right. Yeah, so I'm just to- Tony, Tony Kukoc is uh, Croatian. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> That's who I was thinking of. Kukoc, the Croatian dream. <laughs> but, yeah, the alternative was – that's why everyone will be pissed off. Also, I'm going to tune into game one of that series. It's going to feel like a Tuesday night TNT game in the middle of November. Denver's court, the heater playing there, the style play, everything. It'll be good hoops, though. You know what they should go back to? They should go back. The 2 3 2, I actually agree with the 2 2 1 1 1, honestly. I was going to (laughs) say when uh, they used to put, remember when they used to put the trophy in midcourt? Yes. Like they would do the design. They should 100% do that. There there was nothing like that. Wasn't that the best? I just I'm picturing Miami the Celtics, Heat. yeah, the Celtics or the Heat's court right now. Oh, there's nothing like that. Like you just felt like you were in a big moment. Yeah, and exactly. It's so nostalgic. I could see right now Rondo bringing the ball up, Leon Poe flanking him, KG on yeah. the left. <laughs> That's Ray my Allen childhood. Left corner, yeah. right? Leon Poe is my childhood, basketball wise. Leon Poe was such a. He was such a Boston Celtic. Yeah. I mean, Adam doesn't even know who Leon Poe was. Yeah, you probably no actually idea. don't know who that was. Really? No idea. Sorry. Jeez. Wow. That's pretty blasphemous. Wow. I mean, I that's mean like, he was That's three. like me not he knowing who, like, Greg Dobbs is. Yeah. That's a Philly. It's like, but, it's like um, you're not knowing Brian Snow or something like that. Yeah, of course. Wait, Brian Snow. Eric Snow? Eric Snow. Yeah. Hey, we're going to cut that out. I was thinking of Brian Shaw for some reason. Oh, Brian Shaw, uh, former Lakers coach, no? Or no, yeah. Lakers player. Lakers player. Clippers um, assistant, no. Yeah, we're spewing right now. But. We're just wildly guessing where what country people are from and, and what <laughs> people coached for. And... 
I mean, I knew where all those guys, Leon Poe, United States of America, Eric Snow, USA, all those guys. We could keep going Eric, all night. Eric Blizzard. Nice. H- have you seen what he looks like now? Eric Snow? Yeah. Oh, no. Is he big? Oh, he's huge. Really? It, 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 it's a Twitter meme, yeah. Twitter <laughs> meme. I haven't seen Eric Snow since, I don't know, 2001. <laughs> I actually, I have uh, Eric Snow to thank for teaching me how to do arithmetic. When I was a little kid, when Iverson was on the team, my mom used to be like, what's three plus four? And I'd be like, I don't know. She's like, if Eric Snow has three points and AI has four points, how many points do they have? And I'd say seven points like that. Nice. Keep that in. That's a nice fun fact. Um, But... I guess the only other thing we got, Q's talk. Big, uh, big two weeks. This is like kind of a dead time in a way for college basketball. I feel like because the NBA takes the spotlight so much, but there's usually some sneaky commitments around the May time frame. And uh, our very own Orange got one, and Donnie Freeman, top twenty or top forty in the twenty four class. Um, I don't know. You saw G Max little uh, orange emoji. All the fan base, every everyone's getting getting hyped up for it. Pretty big commitment. Yeah, I think it's just big that we're keeping that high school recruiting going, right? Like Syracuse has always been notorious for getting five star guys and everything like that. I think the biggest thing moving forward is keeping that DC connection, getting those Philly kids, getting those New York City kids, just keeping keeping it all in house in the Northeast and and getting that connection back, right? You have Red, who's from New York City, Griff, who's from New York City, uh, G Mac, who's who's a who's a Pennsylvania guy. Like these are all Northeast yeah. guys. But let's let's keep that let's keep that track going. Let's get let's keep these kids home. And uh, let's get him in the dome with thirty thousand rocking behind him. I really like the uh, the old Biggie feel of it too. Getting Northeast guys, it feels like Cuse in like 05. You know what I mean? Oh, like that's sure. where like their whole roster was from the Northeast, and it was just like they were killing people. So that, that's always good. Like when I was at Villanova, like we were, I was the farthest guy away. Me and Jeremy were the farthest guys away, and we were five hour drives. We had all DC, we had all Philly, and with Coach right not there at Villanova anymore, I think Nep will obviously do a good job in recruiting those areas. But I think I think that that area is kind of for the open. And Brendan mm-hmm. Strong, the, the new assistant coach from Syracuse, he has deep connections in DC. Like, yeah, his, that's why uh, people were saying, "What's his name?" Um, one of my black guys' name from Michigan, Dickinson. Is it Dickinson yeah. or Dickerson? Yeah, Hunter, Hunter Dickinson. Yeah. Yeah, he, uh, he got a Zoom call with the, with the coaching staff with the boys. He had one of the more annoying recruiting uh, like sagas I've I've seen in recent memory. But he did he did sort of consider Cuse, it seems, and it it was basically just because of, um, like you said, strong. Yeah, yeah, strong. Yeah, strong. Strong was the uh, assistant director of team takeover, who was probably the best program in AU basketball back uh, back when I was playing. So. Um, that's just a savvy move by Red and GMAC and them. Like that's those are the oh. guys that take your program to another level. I, I think that was the higher of the offseason. I might be biased because yeah. I'm, I'm a Cuse guy, but I think that was the higher of the offseason just because we all know the saga that Syracuse Athletics has gone through for NIL. You have to find an, an advantage in, in other aspects, and we've done a hell of a job recruiting, recruiting the transfer portal when it, when it comes to Chance Westy, JJ Starling, Naheem, Naheem McLeod. Mm-hmm. To get those three guys, to get a top 40 kid, while knowing that we don't have the same NIL go- going right now for us, I, I I give a lot of credit to our coaching staff. I give a lot of credit to our coaching staff. So I'm excited for this year. I think we have a formid- formidable roster for, for the ACC. I 100%. Think we, have, we have we've obviously shown that we can recruit at, at a high level with, with with this new coaching staff. We're gonna mm-hmm. have probably t- 10, 11 guys who are ACC ready who can play who aren't young guys, and we'll see what happens with Judah. With Judah, if we get Judah back, we will be even deeper. If not, I think we have guards who, who are ready to play in the ACC and it'll give us like that old Syracuse backcourt, right? One hundred percent. But Buddy and Joe obviously made a Sweet Sixteen for run, uh, Sweet Sixteen run for the Qs, but they're not your typical Syracuse backcourt, right? Um, yeah. So I'm I'm excited to get those guys going in there going. I'm excited to start working out with them in, in the in uh late summer and just just test right. them a little bit. Is that your Qs Qs trip late summer? Yeah, I'll probably be late summer, late, late, late yeah. July. Late you July. also mentioned yeah. uh, Naheem McLeod, though. 7'4". Yeah. Transfer from uh, FSU. So I've, I've known Naheem since uh, since high school. Eric, So Eric Dixon and Naheem are both 
from around the Villanova area. Right. And they're, they're Wait, where did Naheem go to high school? He, uh, right, right around Villanova. He, he's right, yeah. he's right outside Eric, the area. Eric went to Abington, right? Abington. Yeah, yeah, I remember that. Yeah, so him and Naheem were like the two best big guys from around that area. Um, and just – it, 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 we, I actually went to one of Eric's games and, and it was against Naheem and I was really impressed with Naheem. He's a good, mm-hmm. good player. Um, and he, I thought he improved a lot at Florida State. He was super, super raw and I think he's improved a lot. I'm excited to see. And we'll see. We might throw some two, three zone at people and, and having Malik Malik Brown on one on one way. Bro, I can't wait for that. That Naheem, also just allows you to be so aggressive like guards-wise, like JJ and JJ and Chance is super athletic, skilled. Like yeah. You have, you have the, the only question is, I mean, we have we do have Justin Taylor, so we, we kind of have that mix of shooting out there too. So yeah. I'm excited. We we have a lot of different directions. We have obviously Chris Bunch coming back. We have Benny coming back. So we mm-hmm. we, we definitely have to link the athleticism for ACC team and, and depth. Yeah, it's super exciting. It's obviously sad to see like the the pillars of the program gone with Joe and Jesse, but like that's why it'll be a, a different look because for the last I don't know six seven years it's basically been the two main guys have, have come back whether it's like i don't know it goes from like tyus to buddy to joe and jesse and then now it's like more of a new look roster and are you gonna say something i was gonna say elijah but oh yeah like good oh, yeah, good that, numbers that whole, like, coming back O'Shea, every year. like all those guys yeah this is the first year that it's completely new mm-hmm. i mean even last year, you had six new guys, but it's still Joe. Joe is that guy. Jesse's that guy that's been there. You know, yeah, he's there the for main, that run, and he's there still. So now there's no one. Yeah. No one's left. The main production will have to come from somewhere else. So that's why I could see them being a little underrated to start the year, and then everyone's like, yeah. what the hell? Syracuse is so good. And I also think, like, we're forgetting, like, the main pillar is gone. Jim Behan. Yeah. Yeah, of course. So, so we're starting over from that aspect, too. So. Yeah. I mean, I'm still excited. I think Red's going to do a great job. He's obviously through a, a great roster in the Syracuse with with having a difficult offseason, right? So uh, I'm excited. There really has not set in for me yet. Until I see a game and they pan to the sideline and coach isn't there, I feel like I'll just still assume he's the coach. <laughs> I wonder if coach is going to be Roy Williams or if he's going to be Coach K. Uh, I feel like neither. I I've mean, Coach K is still. I still. Coach K is still popping up, and like when he's there, he makes it all about himself. I feel like he'll be. I feel like he'll be somewhere in between. He'll show up to games when he wants to, but he'll probably be very, very low key and like not want to make it a big thing if he shows up. Well, Coach isn't moving from Syracuse though, so what else are you gonna do? Like that's, that's what I mean. Winters. Yeah, yeah. You can't just be at dinner during the games. He's gonna want to. He's gonna want to come. I think the dome. He's gonna want to come. <laughs> I know. My thing, like with all those guys, is I wonder how much they're coaching in their head when they're sitting in the stands watching. I agree. I agree, especially from from Beheim. Beheim such an offensive mind too. Like he's probably he'll probably look at the offense and just think of like four sets while while the game's going on that that could work with this with this group. Like all and, like, Be- yeah. and Beheim doesn't have a set system either. He he goes to like what what his players are good at. You know what yeah. I mean? So like no matter whatever. Uh, yeah. You know. You know I I think Buddy mentioned to me something about him like commentating, but I think he's just way too real to commentate. Yeah, no, I, I don't. <laughs> it would be like must listen broadcasting. We should but... we should get him on an uncensored just live watch party, <laughs> yeah. like set up a, a studio live on show. Street. Yeah, yeah. College yeah, game. I feel day. like the networks would be like, Coach, you can't say that, and he'd be like, I don't care at all. Like <laughs> that kid's I mean, playing he, awful. <laughs> he's playing awful. He should have never even shot that shot. Like he's shooting twenty one percent from three. Why do you ever even shoot that shot? Like just stuff like that. It, it, would, it would be. It would be they should do it though. I mean, the we'll local get, we'll get in contact broadcast. With him. We'll, we'll we'll talk to his manager. You know, work some things out. Maybe some G Mac special guests, and you know, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll talk to through. Julie and get it done. The foundation. We'll get the foundation involved. Yeah, I feel like any any Q's fan would like pay. A pay per view to to just hear that, even if they were playing like Lemoyne. The yeah, second yeah. exhibition game, there's like ten thousand viewers on YouTube just watching Jim Beheim. This is a D two, this strong D two team. They can play basketball. <laughs> it's just disrespectful to even say that they're not a good team. <laughs> These guys are good. He's not wrong. Yeah, he's not, not wrong. wrong. But uh, good but yeah, I think I think that wraps up this this week's episode of the Swider Show. Thanks, thanks for everyone for listening. Um, 
obviously really excited for the offseason to go and attack it. Um, Patty and Adam, we got some big plans coming ahead of you, some big time guests coming up. So uh, tune in. Uh, uh, like I said, super excited for the offseason. We playing the summer league, going to be around. Um, and yeah, signed to be a Laker next year. So super excited yeah. for that. So uh, until next time, sweater show. <laughs>